We're not quite heading for home, but let's go to round four. All right. You're, you're, you're up, Ms. Joseph. Well, since I mentioned the New Orleans poem, I want to shove that in. And good, good, good. Substitute it for the poem that I was going to read. Uh, so I decided for my birthday to go to New Orleans. It was a place that I had a connection to because I'd been there with my late husband. But it was also, it's also, anytime you can go to New Orleans, you know. Um, so I was celebrating my birthday and New Orleans is a great place to do things that are out of character. <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> much, much more than, than uh, Vegas. I think Vegas is, is designed to do exactly what you were going to do anyway. But <laughs> gen generally, and I know there are some poets who deeply believe in things like tarot and and uh, astrological signs and things like that. I And I never have put much stock in it, but I was wrong. It wasn't Magazine Street, it was Royal Street. And Royal Street, they have blocked off a good portion of it for street entertainers, fortune tellers, and you just walk from store to store and there'll be people on the corner playing ragtime or something. It It's just the kind of stimulated, stimulation I needed because I had just gone through the third anniversary of my husband's passing. And one thing I wasn't prepared for, everyone says, um that grief gets better with time and that is not true what it can do is sort of a sine wave up and down and i tried to i'll be facing the fourth anniversary in the fall and all of that but um i thought this will be good for me i'm on sabbatical i don't have to rush home let me just get some, soak up some New Orleans flavor. So this is called Tarot Session New Orleans. In a city far more mystical than me, I ask a tarot reader for my fate. Her price is $20. I agree, and she hands me her deck. I hesitate. Then shuffle the bright cards, hope they reveal the answers that I've traveled this far for, the solace that I'm longing for, the deal I made with anxious grieving, that long chore I've been suspended in for these three years. She sees my future, men coming to and fro, abundant health and money, not much to fear. She says his soul's at rest. He's let me go. My husband wants me happy. I'm on my feet. My deepest truths confirmed on Royal Street. Mm. Mm. And that's pretty much, I gave her 20 bucks. She handed me the deck of cards and said, shuffle them. And I was kind of like, these are huge. <laughs> really they're, they're bigger than, you know, standard playing cards. And this is what she told me. She said, there, there are going to be men coming and going, but, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll have, you'll be happy. Which, of course, was what I wanted to hear. Well, <laughs> of course. Did, did was she able to create a context that seemed um, convincing to you to tell you things that 
would not be what she would say to the next person. I don't really think so because I just poured all my troubles out to her. It's like, okay, I'm here in New Orleans. I'm a widow. I've come to, you know, figure out some things about my life. And she's like, say no more. And just starts doing the cards and saying this notice in the poem, since I don't really know much about tarot, I, I have I did sacrifice all the imagery of this cups and wands and whatever. And I really don't care. <laughs> it was more about being listened to and having someone acknowledge, okay, you've been through a hard time, but there's there's light ahead for you. Yes. Interesting. And she did tell me, oh yeah, honey, there's gonna be a lot of men. <laughs> <laughs> she didn't say when i guess though huh <laughs> too much um, too much it has a powerful dramatic element very cunningly arranged yeah um, i i I emailed it to you, so you'll be able to see what it actually looks like. Oh, thank like. you. But of course, it's a sonnet, so it looks like a sonnet. <laughs> As it should. Neat. A lot of reality, and I think that's wonderful. Royal Street, she said. Yeah, it's Royal Street. It, the great thing about it is, you know, there'll be... Uh, jug band on the corner and she, her, she literally had a little table in the in in the middle of the street and because it's blocked off from from car traffic that's not a problem right 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 hmm. yeah i've been in memphis when they do that when they block off the street and, and it's a similar kind of thing although i have not been to anyone who uses tarot cards uh yeah. Uh, I'm an e, I'm an e Jing man myself, so I don't have I don't have to pay anybody. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Th that was a good audible. I think it was good for you to switch it up because you had made reference to that earlier, and I was curious to hear it. So thank you, um, David. Unforgettable. Let me forget all that reminds me of the shoes, heels worn down the way your gait would wear them, the photos, rings pledged with love, the documents from your dissolved estate, our wedding china, sons, notes to yourself, the boxes, stones and shells that you collected, the old ski gear, the stylish belts, the shelf of jewelry that you carefully selected with instructions to give it to friends. And let me soon forget the sound of your low voice when you said, after my life ends, I hope you wait a while but then live your life. Find another woman, live your life. If I forget all that, will you return my life? Mm. Mm. I imagine it took a good deal of care to give the illusion that the order of the collection of details that you present here um, is seems so so casual and unpremeditated. The dropping of sons into the middle of line five between the china and the notes to yourself. I mean, we know among ourselves that these things don't happen by accident, that they're, you know, that they're worked over. 
but there's it's the quality of of the ordering of the details that that produces the effect here isn't it first of all you've got to have details but then you can't just put them in any order and it isn't just the meter because you could have moved a lot of these around um but it, it's something that it's something that strikes me that you've you've done the work to make it appear that these details just are unveiled one after another in a perfectly natural manner. Oh. If that makes if that makes sense to you, that, if you understand. Absolutely. Only another poet would see that. You know, and it's so true. I mean, this is what we were talking about before, Al. I mean, you know, they're all true. They're, I mean, Emily, had, they're, you sure. can imagine they're all true, but I have this huge selection of things. And the, the trick is, and it's very hard to say why exactly, but um, they all had to to fit in, in, in an appropriate way. And uh, I think it's Proust somewhere who says, uh, says somewhere that, you know, a, a lesser writer will go on for pages and pages and pages and describing a seduction scene with the dinner and the china and the candlelight and the curtains and the clothing and the conversation when all you really need is the sound of one stitch breaking. Ah, that's Proustian. That's and a great quote. I have yeah, never heard I, of that. You know, I, I remember it vividly, but I can't remember where it's from. In, in any event, yes, uh, it has to, um, it has to appear. It, you, uh, you, one has to at least aspire to have some sprezzatura, you know, it has to appear. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's it. That's well, the age. You know, I, mean, I, I could go through it and say, um, you know, why I chose them all, but um, but it all leads, after all, to that that statement, which she did say, although it didn't rhyme. I only changed a few words. Yeah, where, where it's a long story, of course, with lots of details. Where she did turn to me and say more or less what I have her say at the end of the poem, which is, you know, mm. it was sort of funny. I mean, it's so absurd. Like, you know, I, I'm gonna die. Uh, and uh, I want you to wait a little while, <laughs> but then go out and live your life. You know, don't do it too fast. She actually cited have a friend, you know, like three months after his wife died, he was living with somebody else. She said, don't do it like Rob, that's insulting. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. I, I don't think that's gonna happen, you know, but uh, <laughs> she, yeah, she gave me this look like, yeah, don't do that. Uh, okay. That's funny. Right. That's funny. Yeah, I mean, that's she that's more or less say go out and live your life. Yeah, that's reality for you. The, which I thought was uh, which I and that's what it's all leading to. I mean, actually, all of the other stuff. Obviously, the suns are very important, and they are cunningly dropped in in that way. But it yeah. is it is all true. All those those are things that nobody else can understand the way I do that are true about her. Her collection of belts and you know. The jewelry. I mean, she left me a note that I discovered that I didn't know she'd written after she had died, saying, "Oh, give this to this person and give this to that person." Sure. Uh, of course, I did that, uh, but it all leads to her voice, that unforgettable moment when she turned to me and said that. It chokes me, mm. up. and I felt, you know, if I don't write that down, that's where the that's where the poem comes from, you know. And then also the the Orpheus myth, where you know you're you're cursed with remembering these things, and if you you can't forget them, uh, and you don't want to, but at the same time, when you remember them, you're it's as if your wife is alive, your spouse is alive, and then as you remember them, then you simultaneously or almost subsequently, it seems almost instantaneously, remember that she's dead, and then she yeah. comes back into the mist. That's what the Orpheus myth is about. You're, you're always in your mind thinking of your spouse as if she's alive. And remember, Eurydice dies on their wedding day. Right. Like serpent. Yeah. And, uh, and so you're always remembering, and then always also remembering that the memory is not alive and real. So uh, yeah, that's in there as well, you know, this notion that you're always remembering, you have always already realized that she's no longer alive, even as you remember it as if, she is, um, 
So, so the That's um, a, not a very coherent comment. Well, so in That's the myth, in the in the myth where Eurydice d dissolves back because he turns and looks back. Right. Mm -hmm. So then you're equating his looking back with the act of memory. That's exactly what it is. I'm convinced yep. that's what that, that myth is. Yep. Myths aren't false, they're true. And when you well, deal with spouse, what happens inevitably is that you have this deep love and, and, and in your mind and in your subconscious, she's still alive. He, he she, they, it, is still yep. alive. And you, you, things happen on a day, on a moment to moment basis where you, in your unconscious or your spirit or whatever you want to call it, the person is still alive. And then you realize at the moment that you're looking back that the person is no longer alive. And then in that sense, the, 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 the phantom, the ghost dissolves. Yep. And you realize, oh, oh yes, of course, that person is alive. And this is a particularly interesting memory because it's a proleptic situation, proleptic situation where the, I'm remembering the moment when she's imagining herself no longer alive. Yeah. And here I am in that moment. Again and again. Mm -hmm. that's, that's okay. I mean, it is, you have to acknowledge it as true, as real. It is. And well, and you found a way to capture it. So do, do you, let me ask both of you, do you find yourselves reading? Uh, I mean, you have to, when you're making collections, if you're making books, obviously you've got to go back over all the work. Do you find yourself reading these these poems um, when you don't have an externally imposed purpose? Do, do you understand what I mean? No. Mm. Do, did you just read them? You mean to, our, to myself? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I mean, of course, when I'm just contemplating the manuscript and reading them over and thinking, well, is that good enough? And you know, yeah, I, that, the question that's is not what I mean. That, that, that isn't what I mean. Okay. Allison, did what I say make sense to you? I'm not sure I get it. <laughs> I guess what I'm saying, and, and this is different for all of us, whether we go back and, and, and look at, you know, look at work uh, when we're not, trying to decide what to put in a book or trying to decide what to submit or looking at something to see if it needs a, 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 a last polish. I just mean, um, when you encounter anything that you've done in the past and just read it as though you were not you, but you're no. just reading a poem. Absolutely. And that's how, but although it's, that's how I decide if they're any good, you know? Yeah, you, so you can do, the, you, and you if can even do as that as with this kind of poem, I guess, is what I'm asking. If it, reads as, yeah, if it reads as if it were written by somebody else, even though it's very personal, then, yeah. then I know that I'm getting somewhere. That's Thank you. That's, that's exactly what I was looking for um, as an answer without my knowing what you yeah, would I mean, say. I drift in and out of them. They're, I mean, obviously, I, we're, we're professionals. We're trying to write in order to... to share something at a professional level with others that's meaningful but at the same yeah. time I, you know i it's 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 really a kind of a meditation and a conversation with oneself with one's spouse in this case with, with the tradition with the past with my yeah you know, yeah partly why i ask is that um every i normally do not go back and listen to my old records, but now I'm, I'm I'm just celebrating 25 years of my record company, so I've got like 19 records, yeah. and every everyone and I've basically written all all the songs on on all those records. So every once in a while, I'll go back and just listen to something, um, just to listen to it, and and that's an interesting ex experience. Um, but the, most of the songs that I've written don't carry this much freight uh, emotionally, if if you see what I'm saying. So I'm just curious whether you could do that. Uh, anyway. Um, I, think it's, I think it's hard for people like us to turn off all of our professional faculties. But um, yeah, I, I, do think, I, I do think there are days when you're not actively revising or writing or editing or preparing. Or you just sort of drift through them and go. 
Yeah. And it's, you know, it's nice if particularly you can read something of yours that as though you didn't write it and take some satisfaction without thinking about what you had to do to make it. Right. If you can like what you do without dwelling on the fact that you did it, <laughs> if that's possible. So, well, okay, I'm going to go to uh, my next to last one here, which is, uh, it's in two parts. It's rather long, but it is a straight narrative, uh, the past and the almost present. And um, built into this poem is the unusual landscape that I grew up in, because I grew up after the age of five in a park. Uh, my father was the superintendent of parks in my city. Oh, and wow. we lived, yeah, we lived in the edge of a 250 acre park that had lakes and um, public tennis courts. And it had a big wooded hill on the top of which was a castle. Mm -hmm. And, um, and it was, uh, it was, the poem will explain better than I can, or at least quicker than I can, what was going on with the castle. <laughs> the poem is called The Parapet. We stood behind my father, my two friends and I, before the side door of the castle, a pocket castle, single family dwelling whim of an American physician, its original discovered on vacation in the English countryside. Its plans were cribbed, its duplicate assembled from rough New Hampshire granite blocks nearby. Mm. Foreign in this landscape, set atop a high hill overlooking the expanse of forest, lake, and pond where I grew up, it was boarded shut, abandoned, given to the city as a centerpiece with its surrounding land to form a park. The city lacked the money to maintain it, so it was locked and no one had been in for decades. But my father had a key. He supervised the city parks. I knew no knights had ever crowded this great hall or kept watch from this modest parapet. But I'd begun to read Sir Walter Scott, and for me, the darkened rooms beyond the door were bursting with a cast of characters whose colors swelled in my imagination. So when my dad took out the iron key, we three boys were leaning toward the door, eager for the climb up to the tower to stand against the topmost stones in safety and see the green earth spread out at our feet, for such were all our boyhood dreams of promise. But once across the threshold, we were in the dark. Slivers of light from boarded windows revealed a blank space emptied of its forms and furniture. Against the wall across from us, a stairway to the tower stopped dead halfway from the ceiling to the floor. We had no way to climb. The view from high above would have to wait. This emptiness would have to do. Our privilege in being there at all would have to live above our disappointment. That view would wait for 40 years. The city's fortunes rose and rehabilitated. The castle was refitted as a venue for public gatherings and celebrations. And one of these, the wedding of a cousin, long decades after I had moved away, had brought me back to it a second time to mark a family joy, but with my feelings torn. For in the hospital nearby, my mother lay deep in her final illness. These days, the doctor said, would be her last. I'd come to tell the father of the bride. Mm. Mom's younger, only brother, he had been a thorn in her side when he was a boy. He'd grown into a fierce ally. To me, he'd been as much a father as my own. At the reception, open double doors arched and welcomed 
High pain soaked the hall in sunlight. It was cozy and profuse, with sprays of flowers close beside the staircase, which led aloft. My uncle had gone up, I guessed perhaps for quiet, to take in the view, to think about the way their paths were crossing, older sister and young bride. Standing against the parapet, he gazed out at the evergreens, the trails that led down to the cooling lake, the ones that led to God knows where, deeper into the trees, the ones that natives to this place had taken centuries ago to destinations we would never know. I stood beside him, reported what the doctor said of days. Without turning his head, his eyes still fixed across the green expanse of park, he said, we're on the front line now. We didn't know it at the time, but he would live a year. Mm. We live to rise. We rise to see. We see what is prepared for us, what we may not turn away from, what we must embrace. We climb in time up to the parapet. Once again, the dramatic clarity and the detail is just very compelling. Very it's a long buildup, I know, to the to the moment, but no, no, it's. I mean, it's this is how drama and narrative work. You build the texture, mm. and then you drive the nail home. Yeah, I'm mixing. My it's all, It's quite true, and I can only imagine how mixed his feelings were. I remember that when he said that we're on the front line because I'm 21 years younger than than he. Um, and he passed the year after my mother, which was, uh, she passed in 98, it's 25 years now. And uh, he passed in 99 the next year. And when he said we're on the front line, I remember thinking, I know you're not talking about me. <laughs> you're on the front line. <laughs> I'm still a young boy, but, you know, now I understand what he meant. <laughs> Keep talking. I'm going to, I'm, I'm, I've got to do something on the other side of the room. Keep talking. <laughs> ah, okay. Um, anyway, so that, that's, um, those were two very memorable moments. The moment when my friends and I got to go into, into the castle, which was just a shell. And then later, when it it had come back to life, um, back to the world, uh, and lost its its mystery. So, all quite true. Um, well, we're now entering the final round it's not a lightning round but it is the last <laughs> round <laughs> so allison what will be your final offering here i'm going to read a poem that is in an anthology uh called the anthology is called the language of loss poetry and prose for grieving and celebrating the love of your life and it was edited by a woman named Barbara Abercrombie, who um, here is her description of why she decided to edit a grief anthology. And th this rang true for me as well. And this is from the Amazon page for this book. When Barbara Abercrombie's husband died, she found the language of condolence irritating, no matter how well intended. And this is a quote from her. My husband had not gone to a better place as if he were off on a holiday. He had not passed like clouds overhead, nor was he my late husband as if he'd missed a train. 
I had not lost him as if I'd been careless, and for sure, none of it was for the best. So she was putting this anthology together, starting to put it together, and she reached out to me via social media because I had made a comment about the way we use passing when we talk about someone dying and some people criticizing that usage and some people embracing it. And she said, do you have any more poems? Cause I'm putting together this anthology. And I had written this poem pretty soon after the loss of my husband. And unlike the controlled and temperate sonnets I ended up writing, this one is it's free verse. It's but it has it has what holds it together, I hope, is anaphora, the repetition of this phrase, mm -hmm. come back to me, come back to me, because in the immediate aftermath of losing my husband it was a he had had some health issues but we were working on them and his death was sudden and not necessarily related directly to what we had been working on uh. um so i the feeling i was left with immediately was well aren't aren't you coming back so this is a spell to bring a dead husband back. Come back to me and fetch your busted heart. Come back to me and take the medications the doctors said would make you well. Come back to me and save me for this guilt, save me from this guilt over not saving you. Come back to me and call your mother. She's lonely for the sound of your voice. Come back to me and read me your poems. I can read them, but it's better if you read them because you wrote them and I'm only a spectator. Come back to me and take your place in this bed that I filled with books and clothes and condolence cards as if their weight could replicate yours, their heft not resembling the bones and body I slept beside. Come back to me and fight me okay. for the remote. Come, come back, let me feed you, come back. Let me rub your sore shoulder with CBD in the hope it would loosen and you could start another day, put on another blue shirt from your closet of blue shirts. Come back, come back, come back with your glasses precariously on your nose. You'd push them back with fingers you called stubby. Come back and find your wedding ring, your pocket change, your heavy fist of office keys, your money under the welcome mat, your pens in a secret drawer. Come back, come back, I say, as I rock my body into that cursed sleep. Come back through the flames and the urns, the platitudes and the eulogies. Come back and we will all the pleasures prove, stopping the clocks and the calendars. Come back, come back, come back, damn it, come back. Yeah. So that poem, that poem's in that anthology, which I recommend. It 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 has a lot of fairly non-sentimental but moving work so it's meant to be the antidote to the to the the facile 
yeah, forms. Yeah. And, and you can tell from her description of what she wanted to do was a lot of us get told by very well-meaning friends, family, acquaintances, colleagues, uh, they're in a better place, all these things that we hear. Um, and I think her attention in doing this anthology was, no, that's not what I want to hear. That's right. not what's going to be useful to to save me in this this dire circumstance I find myself in. Well, this comes across as closer to the raw, you know, the source, the, yes. the, the emotional source. It's raw. Yes. It's raw in, in the sense of, as opposed to refined, which when you put something into a sonnet form, undergoes a process of refinement. So it's still your voice, but it's it's coming from a, you know, from from it's got a different tone. Yeah. I, the, I, I sprinkle some lit references in there so you know anyone knows. <laughs> oh, this woman does know about poetry. She's gonna, she's gonna <laughs> you know, she's gonna name drop Auden, Auden at the back of this poem, at the end of this poem. <laughs> just in case you just thought this was just a rant, she does know something about poetry. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's funny, we, we've seen now a range of different approaches to presenting detail, personal detail, I mean, really intimate personal detail, um, particularly from YouTube, um, um, and, and how different one list can be from another list, because in a, in a way this is like a list. But also the you know the repetition, the three time repetition of the comebacks puts it into the into the spell tradition. It puts it into the you know the um, the trying to tap into a, a more you know a more primal energy source um, tradition. There is a kind of a magical context here, e even though, uh, so there is a kind of a loose form in which you place all of these great details. I mean, the extended image of the bed half heaped with books and cards and uh, that's just so, it's very, it's very powerful personal yeah. image. Just just because I've never seen that, but I can imagine it so, so vividly. It makes its point in my mind as though I saw it, although I haven't. So you make it very real for me, and and all of these details uh, underscore the reality of uh, you know of of the situation. The, the line about guilt for not saving you um, does, it, that's the one that I was referring to in your first poem, uh, where you were talking about blaming yourself. Um, mm -hmm. that, th that this is what, this is the line that connected me to that part of what you went through. That this is, uh, that's one of the, one of the many contending emotions that you go through in times like these include the ones where you blame yourself, especially when it's not a legitimate cause of blame. You know what I'm saying? Right. I mean, it's it's a manifestation of survivor guilt. You know, here you are. Yeah, exactly. You're the one who is left to carry on, but you feel guilty that you didn't save the person or that you have to deliver the bad news to other people. I mentioned his mother who passed away in 2021. His mother um, 
had three children and she outlived two of her three children. Oh, that's and, tough. and there's a poem yet to write uh, an elegy for her where she calls me and sort of is consoling me and I'm consoling her on the loss of her son and she's consoling me on the loss of my husband. And I haven't oh. found a way to sort of wrap that up in a poem yet, but I, yeah. I remember her, her calling me after and she was still a pretty sound mind when immediately after his loss she wasn't healthy enough to come to his funeral but i i just thought about how interesting this was that she was calling me sort of welcoming me into in a way widowhood which she had already experienced because my father-in-law had passed about five years earlier so there are still things I need to write. And that's that's one of my problems that I don't, I, elegy seems never ending to me. And I've written elegies for my mother and my father and now my husband. And it seems like I'll be writing elegies until I die. And then I hope someone will write one for me. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, that's part of the role, isn't it? Um, it is. Mm. Well, so that that poem that's yet to be written is a is a potent power source for you. And when the time comes, you'll put it in. You know, you'll you'll put it into shape. Mm -hmm. Well, because it, it's, it's it's there. It's a it's a like a triple elegy because it's an it's going to be an elegy for her. It's going to be an elegy for my father-in-law, and it's also going to be a an elegy for her son, my husband. So it's like a quadruple elegy. Wow. Well, you got your work cut out for you. Yeah. <laughs> Finding a we, we we. I don't want to make a call on what form is best for that, but. I, I'm I not sure you could do it in. It, I'm not sure you it, could do it in 14 lines. It, it may be an essay. <laughs> yes, it may. <clears throat> wow. Well, thank you for the for this group, this group of poems. I mean, they're they're very rich. And thank you for being so so candid about you know walking us through the situations that, you know, that occasioned them because they're not, uh, you know, these are not our favorite things to talk about. Um, well, from, the, from the vantage point of someone who teaches this material, that's something I, I tell students that a lot of what ends up in the poem isn't necessarily what got you there. So you may and think you're writing about one aspect of grief, but here's another. Yeah. That the poem's going to insist on you dealing with. So they're always like, well, I meant to write it about this day when I was with my grandmother. It's like, well, yes, but you may want to take a turn into something more revealing or something that makes you very vulnerable. Well, they're lucky to have you to shepherd them through those moments because it's not instinctive when you're starting out to already know how to let the real story come through when you sit down to do something else. Mm -hmm. You know, that doesn't come, you're not, you're not born knowing how to do that. And you have to give yourself permission. And the earlier you learn it, the better. So the fact that you are bringing this to them as something that they should that they should do and that they should learn how to do that's good that's what you know i always say i didn't teach anybody anything but sometimes i was, I was in the room when something happened <laughs> so wow well 
David, I think you're going to read your long one now. Is that correct? Yes. Well, take it away. This is quite this is quite a quite a thing. I just want to say, Allison, that was really beautiful. Bravo. Thank you. Really touching. Thank very, you. Very uh I mean I on the one hand, you know, as a poet, I want to say it's it's successful as a poem. On the other hand, I feel you. Oh. Beautiful. You person. still there? Yeah, I'm here. Yeah, you froze for a minute. Also, check your mic Back level home. because I, I I don't want to I don't want us to miss anything of this of this poem that you're going to read and it you're. Be, it seems to be working. I'm near the microphone. Is, can you hear okay? Yeah, but at the end of lines sometimes trail off a bit. So be, okay. be aware of that. I'll try to be a bit louder. And if it doesn't work, you can ask me to stop and you can edit it up. Yeah, I don't want to ask you to stop on this one. <laughs> so. Uh, there is no plan. O oh, son of woman and of man, there is no plan. There is no plan. The stars are burning. God is doing what God can. And yet the hours, too, are burning. And there is no plan except to circulate these words as I wait beneath, beneath the thinker at the gate of hell. All manner of things are not well. I'm sitting in a bar in Denver that's a bit loud and boisterous thanking a waitress for bringing me a dozen oysters, raw, cultivated Australoidae, who, when they were hatched, doubtless could not conceive that somehow they would leave the bed to which they were attached and end up on a flat tin pan filled with crushed ice, which is not agreeable for naked oysters, let alone that knives would pry their hard homes open indifferently and make them sit quivering so vulnerably next to my drink. Grey goose, olives, dirty, up and dry. For my raw, salty delight, a juicy little protein meal of protandric bivalve filter feeders saying goodbye, goodbye, goodbye to their sedentary lives on this cold, snowy Colorado night. I've been here since whenever. And I'm speaking to one now. Come closer. You'll learn why, thus said a lover to an oyster. Oh, my little oyster, here's a kiss. Perhaps you're asking if this is why you were hatched. You're on my sucking gullet, on my sucking gullet's roster, and eating you's my plan. Why so pale and wan? Mm. I'm sorry for my enthusiasm to end your quick and briny life and for the sudden ouster from your calcium cave onto my tongue while you're still alive or close and young enough, but so it goes. I hope and pray to find a pearl in you as I once did loose between my teeth where it slid from one of your forgotten relatives, but doubt such luck will show today. These days, the bad luck never gives up, and in the end, there is no plan. And yet, not in spite of this, but concomitant with it, I am a dis disciple of gratitude and what it helps me say. I am still, and also, grateful for every argument and kiss, for every moment, sweet or rude, she ever shared with me before mm. the slurpy, fateful oyster hour far from the deep see. I am grateful, grateful, and will curse no one on earth or in my obscure heaven during the receding tide of all the sweet and sour times rested from our rock of days by her bad MRI CT It's none of your damn business, which is just to be my dinner, but she was a dancer and a good one. 33 years together. Now she has it and it's heavy weather. I've done what I can. I've done what I can do to save her life. Surgery, immunotherapy, targeted 
MEC inhibitors, insurance, and the gamma knife, but melanoma, metastasizing in the brains, no picnic. Oyster eats, eats joy the way a hurricane devours islands. Yet if God asks me, do you understand what sublime awe ducks? I'll have to say I've had my truck with cancer and its tricks, which lurk like dirt and dead men's fingernails. I did my best, and if that best can't work, if brains cannot breed better luck, there is no answer except the strange good answer that is gratitude and tears, which both burn brightly here in this dark bar. Yes, oyster, on my little oyster fork, I am grateful, I am weeping, and people in this joint are noticing in that sideways way that people have before they gesture to each other with their eyes to not so discreetly say, did you see that? That I am talking to an oyster. But the hell with them. They can't know my good reasons in this here and now. They wouldn't get the point. Oyster, you are delicious and life is fine, although that is no plan. And when friends ask me if there is a plan, I say, well, that's a reasonable question, though not a version of the best one, which might be, where lies your thankfulness? Which I now see may be God's question, to which I could answer, and I will. Her long braid and that sweet coy smile, her strangely strict rules for all food, her ambivalent plies, her skinny style, Certain kisses I will not describe. Her <laughs> graceful head wall telemark turn. The fierce way she took pleasure when she chose to let me give it. Her anger's snap and long slow burn. Her love of cars and boats and shoes. Her willingness to love my tribe. The way she paid her dancing dues. The way she sometimes holds my hand. Her indifference to the news. That time she mountain biked the devil's punch bowl, descending gothic road to her new life, her graceful prose, her bunioned ballet toes, the way she knows the mountain flowers, columbine, penstemon, Indian paint, paintbrush, scarlet gilia, and where the slate flows into pools, her regimen of exercise, her lies, her practiced ease teaching Pilates, the way she carried boys within her and held my hand as they came forth, dripping celestial cheese, life made out of life. The way she sometimes lay her head upon my shoulder, sweet and more sweet, growing older. The way she said I'd have to wait because I don't do that on the first date. Her big ears, little eyes and nose and mouth, her childhood pain, her love of beaches, the fact she knows I don't like peaches or any other kind of mushy fruit. Look, <laughs> here she is in full white bathing suit, wet and smiling, hair draped over her left shoulder, young and strong and lithe, left foot lifted slightly, stepping up the white sand from a blue lagoon. Too bad oysters don't have eyes. Oh, Emily, oh, Emily. Each line here is just a summary of your gift for mimicry, your doodles of new blooming roses, your sweet small breasts and cat-like muscles, and your feline sympathies for Ofer, Ferrari, Micah, Rico, Margot, Mr. C. The way you taught me yoga poses, your slightly awkward water crawl, refusal to the day you die ever to accept you might be beautiful. The grace with which you wear a shawl, your rules, your lists, your graceful twists, your kindness, laughter, manners, scorn, depression, howling rage without concession, each succeeding each in swift succession. The time you broke a pinky finger hauling on a mooring bowline, your ukulele and your high thin voice, the stories of your life before you changed your world for mountains a fateful primal choice for lacoliths and summer thunder, rivers and their chasms, the flowers, 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 and your gratitude for big orgasms. Your true kind friends, the way you turn the dishwasher on while I'm playing the piano, 
the way you <laughs> climb scree fields, the way you walk up airplane aisles and women slyly snarl in silence at that slim, strong figure, your hurt, your strength, your ache, your inability to tell a joke, the way you <laughs> smoke a cigarette in guilty pleasure, the way you like to linger near the ocean, your flawed sense of direction, but sound of money, your tolerance of my many flailing flaws, your eccentric contour from effect to cause, your funny, tense take on leisure. There is no end. There is no answer. There is no measure. Sorry. There is no end. There is no measure. There is no plan. But what blasphemy silence would be. And I'm not afraid to play talk school. It's a job, you helpless little oyster blob. <laughs> would, and how could I, deny the messy good that shines and has shined and shines through through her, and yes, also through you, scattering divine harmonics in modern skeletonics. These scattered rhymes, spoken versions of the broken vessels must suffice. So, Oyster, I, a lover, thank God as best I can, even when M says, I want to live, but this is misery. Day after day, I've been cursed. My life is over. I've never been so low. I know I'm dying. There's nothing anyone can do. There's nothing anyone can say. I just can't do this anymore. I should have died in that car crash. Why so much pain? Why is there cancer in my brain? I just want angels that I don't believe exist to come down and take me away. Oh, Dave, mm. it hurts so much. Even then I bow, cracking with wonder, agony, and love, and gratitude, yes, gratitude, which seems to make no sense, but does, as there is no other choice. And now I understand at last why the blessings do just what they say, and why it no longer seems odd to say that the trajectory of God is God. Oh, unobservant oyster, down you go. For all this and more than anyone can say, I'm grateful, grateful both to her and God and to you too, for every moment rich and fateful, oh little and unkosher oyster, who cannot hear her voice or mine, now safely stomached. And even so, it's not enough, for how can a wave explain the sea? And so my work will never end, for who can know? and who can understand. And that is why, while there is love and gratitude and tears, oh oyster, now we've joined as one, there is vitality and there is labor and each of us is doing what he can. Although there is no plan, oh oyster, that once was and no, lo no longer is, oyster that I love and savor, no, there is no plan. Mm. Wow. <laughs> <clears throat> it's a complicated and rich cake. <laughs> it's an oyster. <laughs> um, boy, that oyster makes so much of the rest of it possible. You, you know, you froze there for for a second. Al, I didn't hear that. I said the oyster makes so much of the rest of it possible because you keep because the circumstance you keep being as a listener you keep being brought back to the to the to the ground of a, of a man talking to an oyster that he's about to eat <laughs> and and that one of the things that I love about it is that without making a show of it the speaker is playing the god of destruction for the oyster right. the That's way that right. he the way he is himself the victim of the god of destruction that's why i say absolutely. the oyster is is what permits so much of the rest of it 
because that's I, I think it's a really elegant concept for a for a structure for, for this kind of, to talk about this kind of thing. Because and, and I love the fact that you don't dwell on it. You just eat the oyster. <laughs> Well, it's, you know, a, it's a good it's a good thing there are a dozen of them, so the poem can just keep going. <laughs> <laughs> so it more or less happened. That, I mean, out of my wife, it's a long story, but and this is you know, this is only relevant among us in the workshop here or somehow. But I mean, uh, my wife fought melanoma for five years. We it, we beat it back, and she had a year and a half of good, of good health, very good health. And then it came roaring back, uh, stage four, it breached the blood brain barrier and she got brain metastases Ooh. and had a seizure and had a car accident, wrecked a car and broke her back and, you know, uh. really, really hard. And uh, I was, I wrote, I was literally, we were staying in a place in Denver while we were, she, she was getting all these gamma knife surgeries, which are uh, radiological surgeries that are extraordinary and that extended her life yet again for a while. And um, I was literally sitting next door in this restaurant, uh, Jack's, it's called J-A-X, and it's a seafood restaurant. And I was, I mean, the poem, I, I have an, the, the original draft somewhere. I just, I literally was, that's exactly what happened, Al. You, um, it's a very good reading. I mean, I was sitting there thinking, you know, these oysters are more or less alive. They're sitting on a bed of ice. They've been hauled. They don't know why. They've been hauled out of their home and given exactly. a bed of ice to eat. And I'm sitting there like sobbing, thinking, I'm just going to eat. I'm just going to destroy their lives. I'm going to eat them. And that's exactly what's happening to my wife's life. And yep. uh, it's so simple and obvious and brutal and banal at the same time. And and this poem just came roaring out, you know, uh, and, and it was really quite a quite a time. And um, obviously it's filled with, I mean, there's a hundred literary allusions in there. I'm sure you've caught a lot of them. You know, and it uh, it's uh, it just came. Um, it's a, we were talking earlier about working your whole life to be ready to write what you need to write out of love and for something that really matters. You know, after what we've been through, and I think this this should be true for anyone our age, more or less. I mean, things there are so many things that happen in life that are so difficult and profound and important. I read most. Frankly, I'm just going to be blunt about it. I pick up the journals, I pick up the books, and I look at them, and I say, "Why the fuck don't you people write about stuff that matters?" Yeah. What are you doing with your life? Yeah. You love people. You have friends. You have lovers. You have parents. You have spouses. You have children. You know, and 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 you know, write about something that matters. Uh, the what have you been training to do? It's one of the reasons, perhaps, that poetry. Uh, doesn't enjoy the, the the kind of cachet perhaps that it should in the sense that so many of our colleagues don't frankly seem to write about things that matter or, or to write about them in a way that matters at the very least. Obviously you can yep. write you can write about a pin cushion as and make it meaningful. Elizabeth Bishop did and Wallace Stevens did. Wallace Stevens can write a bull holding carnations and it can become one of the greatest poems of the century. Floating in water, right? Uh, the imperfect is our paradise. But uh, it really did sort of start there. Obviously, I worked hard on it and realized that what I was doing was a kind of sort of very modified skeletonics and on and on and on. But the uh, it's really a kind of intentional dog roll. Uh, but I'm glad it I'm glad it lands. Um, and uh, I'm glad I was able to catch it when the ball was thrown to me in that moment of a just tremendous distress, just terrible, terrible distress. Uh, you know. The, well, I two can, things. I, I could go on, but you know, enough, I won't. Well, two, let, let me go on for a bit. Two things about it that, that I want to say is, is one is um, there is enough of the repetition of rhyme both internal and end that is not anticipated because it's not a formal structure but Correct. but Absolutely but right. it but it breathes it breathes and it rides because you touch down 
into the rhyme and then and then you you're off again you bounce off again into something else so structurally that's i mean so okay so you got the rhyme on one level that that has that creates a kind of structural uh underpinning then you've got the oyster as a kind of a dramatic conceit but then the other thing that i really appreciate about it is that the message is about gratitude and in the context in which you're speaking, that's the toughest thing to bring, to carry through the flames, because everybody could understand if you were going to complain. But instead, you take on the job of articulating, you don't just say there's gratitude, you try to account for it and articulate it in the most dire of conditions. And that's what makes that's what makes this so so dynamically powerful because of not what you're doing and and how are you doing it and where you're doing it the context in which you're doing it and then that telescopes into the life that you know that created that context so it's just it it's just strong in so many ways um but i'm one who very much and you'll see that at the end of my last poem I'm definitely one that comes down on the side of gratitude. Uh, but it's hard to feel in the moment, and it's even harder to express, I would submit. So thank you for doing it. Oh, thank you. Uh, you have to be, what would be the right word, determined. Yeah. You know, what, what occurs to me, and it, it, it in the writing, it happened in that moment, in the writing of the poem, when I really, What's the right word? When I finally felt it, and it's a lot, it's a long story, but you know, um, to boil it down as easily as to the smallest pearl possible. And I did once find a pearl in an oyster, by the way. I chewed, I ate an oyster and I went crunch and there was a pearl, a sort of a badly shaped pearl in the oyster. There was a pearl in my yep. oyster. That, yep. it's all, so everything in there is true. But the, uh, sure. but that night, there was no pearl. But you know, when you're faced with this kind of primal, brutal reality and truth and set of facts, you have some, you do have some choices, and um, you come to understand the wisdom of the really come to understand the wisdom of great of gratitude. Because yeah. what's the alternative? The alternative is curse God and die, and it just yeah. doesn't seem right. I mean, in the sense that. Uh, the only reason you feel the grief is because you felt the love in the first place. If you're feeling the grief, that's evidence that the love is still alive and still existed and still matters. And if you focus only on the grief and you forget the love, that's literally the devil talking. You have to, uh, yeah. you have to, you have to remember the love. You have to, because the love is the truth. The love is the cause, and then. Um, uh, well, so that gratitude is a natural. I to turn off my video here. Uh, you're, it, no, it's it, you have to be. Uh, you have to. You have to be. You have to be strong to feel and be aware of and accept the gratitude. It, the gratitude doesn't mean you don't feel the pain. You, you feel the gratitude that much more powerfully because of the pain. Because you would only feel the pain if you felt the love first. Otherwise, yes. you couldn't possibly feel it. So what this returns me to in my case is uh, my background where we don't ask, you know, God for a pony for Christmas. <laughs> Not that anybody <laughs> necessarily does. But, it, it, but that, you know, you say, uh, I mean, just think of the blessings, right? You say, uh, blessed art thou, uh, 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 king of the universe, who brings forth the fruit of the vine. You don't say, dear God, please give us some wine. You've already got the wine. You say, blessed art thou who creates wine. Thank you very much. Now let's drink. Yeah. And, and uh, that's, <laughs> that's deep. Man. I mean, actually, it's so much more deep than I ever realized when I was younger. And it, uh, uh, I, so it's all about the gratitude. Because if you don't express the gratitude, everything is just dirt or worse than dirt. Everything is nothing. So that's what the poem is. Well, I'm glad. And I'm worried yeah. that my commentary is not worthy of what I worked so hard to write. 
but well, you know, no, that's personal level. Okay, this is who I am. This is what I have to say. No, that it, that's that's fine because it because it, it does come through that it that it is a poem about gratitude and that through the welter of the language and of course it is a great yawp, <laughs> as Whitman might have put it. Um, that it, it does come through and and I'm just I'm grateful that you got to the point of feeling all of it because if you didn't feel all of it you could certainly not have written it. Um, it's just to to jump on the no you know no tears in the writer no tears in the reader frost knew what he was talking about again you got to go there to know there but you've been someplace special and it comes through so thank you thank i you. like it thank you um, you guys are fantastic i mean this is a great conversation i appreciate it well uh i'm gonna try to do the capper now um do it uh we've had a good long conversation and this is this is a poem that I wrote on the day that would have been my mother's 85th birthday. I, I like writing poems on days that have special meaning. So I write poems on holidays and birthdays and other days like that. And I, I kind of make a challenge to myself to, to finish it during that day. So it's really the work of, of the calendar. Um, it's called 85 if, because she would have been 85 had she lived. I wrote it on, on January 31st, which was her birthday in uh, 2007. Uh, she passed in 98, so she was uh, 76. Um, and this is a poem about that, the process of, of her dying. 85 if. The whump of iron on cotton. My left arm descended in a shallow arc that lulled me, affording comfort in the repetition. I stood where I've seen her stand at least a thousand times, over the ironing board that folded down, out of the wall, beside the coat closet, in the front room. Silent, she sat off to my left. I'd moved the chair, the one she'd never used, until her sickness drove her into inactivity from the far wall, so she could see the set, the one she'd never watched, more easily. And it cut down the number of her steps, the ones she had to take so slowly now to get there from the kitchen. Hiss of steam and gurgle from the innards of the iron would interrupt and punctuate the soft insistence of my glancing blows. I worked the surfaces with care, wagging the tip around the buttons, down the collar seams, and revving up the smooth expanses of the front and back. The easy busyness, a blessing, I saw now she had enjoyed for all those years when I had watched her iron. The spray starch sputtered. I put down the can and dipped the iron's tip down to the spots of wet. Repeated questioning ensued. I pressed until the surface gleamed again. I folded up the shirts when I was done. She asked to see them, and she ran her hands so lightly over one I might have missed how much her fingers told her. It was dry, the collar starched but not too glossy, smooth without a hint of scorching, folded up neatly just like new. Then the pronouncement. You do a nice job. Mild astonishment, combined with pride and followed by relief, had found its way into her voice. And then, directed half to me, half to herself, she said, then I won't worry now. You're in good hands. Her cancer had returned that spring. We knew what every day together meant but we assumed a different normalcy now that she couldn't push. Her mastery over the world demanded her attention, it always had, she'd never dropped her guard, and hers alone. Depression child, she lit a candle at the altar, self-reliance would be her creed. Mm. She couldn't quite believe a job she might have done 
could ever be done really right by anybody else, and surely not as well. So why have hell? She did it all and did it all herself. She pounded through 10,000 dinners, paid the bills, hectored my dad and got him moving, though never at the pace she would have liked. Ah. Was, cornic was cornucopia to family and friends. She was the whirlwind and our world emerged out of her will, spun ceaselessly. For her, there had been no easing of spurs until her body wouldn't carry her. So now she let go. And like horses loosed so long ago, she had forgotten them and saw them as though new when they returned. The lessons came. I think she was surprised to learn how trusting me to do for her after a lifetime, mine, when it had been the other way around, would make her feel. I hope it brought her back to five again, when parents would provide and to accept was all her role, before her march began and she put up her arms against the world. I know it was a lesson learned in time to let her turn to me to help her die. For later, in the hospital, weeks after the doctors told me any time now, Days before the end, I at her bedside, by ourselves, she said, half puzzled, half dismayed, what's happening to me? I don't like it. I didn't have to search for what to say. You're still facing this world, I said. You need to turn and face the other way. And she, who shook the earth and might have upbraided heaven, took it to heart and said yes to it all. So we moved closer as she moved away. Mm. There have been lives more blessed, but ours will do. Mm. You can't, uh, you can't get past it if you're not there when you can be there at the end. And, you know, your poem touches, touched on that, David. Um, if it means so much for you to be there and you there, that gives you a feeling of satisfaction that nothing else can. And if for some reason you're not there, you, you miss that, you know, you miss that connection. It'll um, haunt you for the rest of your life. I, I, I would guess. I, I, can, I can only guess. But, um, yeah, it was... It was a point of frustration for my mother because she didn't have that with my with my dad, because in the poem that I sent you that I didn't read because it was really too long, um, which talks about his final days. Uh, he went into a coma following brain surgery and we didn't have any communication with him in the last two weeks. And that was very, very hard for my mother being told as as you as uh, as I believe you said, Alice, and the doctors tell you that you're they're aware, even though even though you don't get a, a response, um, but still you don't you don't know. And that was my mother was a very verbal person, and she was very frustrated that she didn't have a chance to have that communication. So the fact that she and I had it was a really a very great uh, blessing. And that's why I had to write about it in this poem. But that's really the gratitude that I take. Um, and that's why I thought it would be appropriate for me to follow what you read, David, with, uh, with what I have to say about 
one kind of gratitude. Well, as with your other poems, Al, uh, what strikes me again and again is the, the calm, steady, clear eye, the attention to the detail, all in the service of a very clear narrative or character study. It's unusual. Yeah, again, there's a big Funny. there's a big build up, you know, there's a big build up with the whole long passage about ironing, but it's in the service of nailing down the tent of her character You're because <laughs> so anyway, I don't, I don't know that I've read this very often. So thanks to you two for, uh, for giving me a, a platform where I could read it. I think I would guess that we all feel that way. I would also guess that maybe there are some poems that we've read today that uh, we haven't read before or that were that are probably not going to be part of a regular reading lineup that we, that we read in public gatherings because this is a more personal and intimate one. Um, that's just my guess, but it's the way I feel. So thank, not, not thank you. Not true. I mean, I'm, you know, poetry should take the top of your head off. As somebody once said. Yeah. So if, well, if, that is what you say. You, fire, you, you, fire all you have, I mean, honestly, you have staked that out, and um, but still, in a room with a lot of people, there's a different impact than uh, a couple of people, or at least this is a special context for that kind of for that last poem in particular. So, anyway. I think um, it's a wonderful poem, and you should put it out there, man. It's, you know, and I'm going to, that's what I'm going to do, and I encourage you too, Allison. I mean, this is what people actually want. This is it's what they true. Need. I mean, it's well, true. It's, it's I mean, such it's an old poem. poem. I mean, it, you know, Come on, it's 16 it there, years man. old. But, uh, yeah, I mean, well, I take your point. Dante's um, 700 years old. He said that's read in public. <laughs> yeah, but he's not reading it himself. <laughs> Doesn't matter. I, I would go. I'd go to that reading. <laughs> <laughs> he's very old, but he's. Tanto en esta parra, la dona mia con el alto y saluta que ogni lingua deve tramando mute gli occhi non la rispondi guardare. Oh boy. Sentendo se laudare benignamente di un muta vestuta a par che sia un cosa venuta da cielo a terra a miracolo mostrare. Mostrasse si piacerebbe mira che dà per gli occhi in dolcezza al cuore che intendere da prova che non la prova e parte when I, when I hear come. that when I hear that all I can hear is my mother saying to me we, your father and I spoke in Italian in front of you because we wanted you to go and learn Italian and you never did it <laughs> They probably didn't talk it, like that, to be honest, as articulate as they may have been. No, no, they spoke in dialect. But wh whenever she told me that, and she told me that more than 10 times, I said to her, well, you didn't inspire me to learn Italian, but what you did do was make me a better musician. Because I listened to the two of you talking, and I didn't pay any attention. I didn't know what the words meant, and I didn't care. I listen to the emotion in the rise and fall of your voices. So you made me a better listener and a better musician. She said, mm. yeah, yeah, yeah. But you should have learned Italian. <laughs> <laughs> then you'd have Dante and Petrarch. Yeah. And I still, should, and I, still, I still should learn Italian. But anyway, it's, it's past the witching hour. But you, thank you, too. I... We, we really navigated through this um, with, with great sincerity and seriousness of purpose, but with some humor. And, and I'm, I'm in your debt. Thank you both. You're welcome. Well, you I'm going to sign you off. Are, you guys are extraordinary. I'm very grateful to you, Al. Uh, I, I learned so much about both of you and thoroughly enjoyed it. It's such... Uh, I, I just want to say, you know, I mean, this this 
loosely, this loose group of which I suppose we're all part, you know, whatever you want to call it. I don't like labels very much, but people who really care about their craft and work hard and who come together with, um, you know, an open heart and an open mind for each other. Uh, I find it deeply grateful, uh, you know, there's very few corners of the poetry world in which I'm very interested in participating anymore after having done my share. And this is, this is one of them for sure. Well, great. So grateful. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it, this is, it's a good way to start the third season is all I can say. And this one's going to be going to be cut up into two, two halves and it'll run in August and September. So, okay. uh, so be be prepared and I'll I'll give you a heads up. But uh for now, pleasant dreams. It's 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 later for me than it is for you, but it's it's pretty late even for you guys. So thank you very much, and I will I will say good night, Gracie. Good night. <laughs> good night. Good night. Bye.